Hey guys, and welcome to Petrolped. Now, just before Christmas, I put out a video when I collected this, my latest Hendy long-termer, the Toyota RAV4 plug-in hybrid. Well, over the Christmas break, we've driven this car quite a lot. We put well over a thousand miles on it, and I think I'm now in a good position to bring you my full review of the car, the things I like, and there are many of them, and the things I'm not so keen on. I'm gonna start actually with the name, plug-in hybrid. This car works best when you remember to plug it in. So let me just put the charge cable away and park it over there, and then we'll take a really good look round. But before I do that, make sure if you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel, helps me get access to other cars. And if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. But roll the titles. Brr, you can definitely tell winter is here. It's freezing cold today and a bit blowy as well. But I wanna start this video by taking a walk around the outside of the car. I said on the collection video, I think the looks of the new RAV4 are very striking and I like them a lot. And the more time I've spent with the car, the more they've grown on me. It's a very angular, muscular car. And certainly the looks have evolved a lot since the first RAV4 we saw a couple of decades ago now. I think it's aimed at a slightly different market now as well. This is very much a kind of urban SUV, compact SUV, um, aimed at the family market. This car does have an off-road mode, but I don't think I'd really want to take it off-road, to be honest, any more than a wet, grassy car park. And I think you'll probably find this car starts to have problems. If we start off at the front, it's a very angular, muscular, aggressive looking front end to the car. And I like that a lot. There's quite a lot of black plastic, shiny black plastic trim on this particular spec, although I do like the white and black contrast when it's clean. It's clean-ish at the moment, but when I got back from Cornwall after nearly 1,500 miles of driving, this car was disgracefully dirty. But I do like it a lot. I think, though, this car has a big challenge, and, and actually any car in that compact SUV segment, is that they're all becoming... They're all very good cars. The Hyundai Tucson I had recently, this, they're, they're all in that segment and it's very difficult to stand out above the crowd. They all become very samey. They feel quite samey. This is a plug-in hybrid. The Tucson I had was a, uh, a self-charging hybrid. I know lots of people hate that name, but I'm gonna use it anyway because it differentiates it from a plug-in hybrid. So they do wanna stand out and be edgy. And I think the external looks of this car certainly do that. I, I can imagine there are some of you out there that won't like it at all. But for me personally, I like the look of this car. And when you come back to it in a car park, it does stand out and it does look quite cool. Let's take a wander around the back and just start to talk about the rear styling and also the practicality, which for me is one of the stars of the show of this car. So yeah, if you think the front's angular and pointy, it continues around the back. I do like the spec of this car with the white and then it's almost like white lower half, black top half. This black shiny plastics on the kind of uh, bumper area, privacy glass, kind of a, a little spoiler on the back. It does look quite cool. I'm not a massive fan of the tiny exhausts. So I'd rather either have them just a little bit bigger or maybe just two next to each other. They just, I don't know, it reminds me a little bit of when the, when the new Vantage first came out and you had these tiny little pea shooter exhausts on the back. Yeah, they just, they just need to be a bit bigger. And I know it's not a performance car, but just aesthetically, I think it would look much better with just slightly more thought given to the exhaust styling. But if I open the boot, and one of the things I'm gonna say is this is the slowest opening electric tailgate in the world ever. There's a huge amount of space in here. Uh, we've got half of the beaches of Cornwall still in the back. It needs a bit of a hoover. But we went away over Christmas break and the, the dog sat actually on the back seat in harnesses and we filled this boot. It's cavernous, loads and loads of space in here. But the big question is, is it big enough to fit a bike in the boot? Well, it's dead easy to drop the seat. You literally just, from the back, you can just do that. And the next thing I need is a bike. Bear with me. Now then, this is my 
Arcadex gravel bike. And I'm pretty confident that it's gonna fit in there. Absolutely no worries whatsoever, even with the saddle up, even with the wheels on. No worries whatsoever. Now, I've had a few comments when I've done this in the past. You should put the rear wheel in first. Well, I could do that, but it fits absolutely perfectly in there with both wheels on. Clearly, if I took the wheels off, I could probably get two bikes in there. It's huge once you drop the seats in this car. Absolutely huge. So yeah, no worries about getting a bike in the back. And there's plenty of space for the dogs. Good job this bike's so light and lovely. Right, I'll just leave this over here a minute. So, it certainly uh, wins on that one. I've got the kind of boot hard, or the, the boot floor protector in there. There's a little space here, like under floor storage. That's just enough to put any charge cables that you might have in there. But if I just raise the seats, Close the tailgate and jump in the back, see what the rear passenger room's like. Now I haven't actually spent any journey time sat in the back of this, but the pups have, and they reported in and said it was lovely. The interior trim of this car, this particular spec level, is lovely. These seats trimmed very, very beautifully. They have the look and feel of something far, far more high-end uh, than you would think of a Toyota RAV4, in my humble opinion. It's, it's pretty simple in here. There's a, there's a couple of um, power sockets down there for USB, but it is a really comfortable place. The pan roof helps with the lighting, and there's loads and loads of space in here. And as I said, I've got long, long legs, 34 inch inside leg, and that seat is, sat, is set for me. So plenty of space in here, that's for sure. Now the side profiles are pretty good as well. I really like the angular uh, wheel arches. As I said, there's that gloss plastic trim around them, but the increased ride height makes the car look like a kind of SUV. And this particular spec, it's fitted with mud flaps, most excellent, but also the optional side steps, which just make the car, I think, look even more premium and even more SUV, if that's possible. Have a driver's seat, pretty good in here. 1st thing that happens when you get into the front seat of this car is you instantly feel like you're in a quality car. The choice of materials in here, this is the top spec car and I know if you watch my collection video, this particular car is around £47,000. That is a lot of money, so it needs to feel premium. The first thing you get when you, when you, when you get in the car is on the inside of the door handle is like a rubberized material and it just makes the door feel really solid and firm and just oozes quality and I love that about the car and that rubberized um, textured material um, follows through onto the surrounding controls for the air conditioning and also onto the infotainment as well. I like that very much. There's leather everywhere. The seats I've mentioned already when I was sat in the back but the front of the seats and the trim Give the car a real premium feel. There's a leatherette on here with red contrast stitching, red contrast stitching on the, the gator around the, uh, the, the gear stick. It's a really, really lovely place. Let me just fire the car up so we can talk a little bit more. This is the top spec car. It has every gadget and gizmo you would expect. It's got adaptive cruise control. It's got automatic dimming full beam. Um, it, it's got a range of different drive modes. It's got heated seats. It's got vented cool seats. It's got electric seats. It's a well-specced car. However, it does have a few things that in my opinion, let it down. And first of all is that. So I've never been a big fan of infotainment screens that stick up out of the dashboard. I've said that a million times on videos, and this for me is a great example of one. It just, I just think it lets the interior of the car down hugely. If it had been integrated into the dash, it would have looked better. However, that's not where the problems end. For me, the problem with the infotainment system is it just, it just feels a little bit outdated. It feels like an, a little bit of investment is needed. The satellite navigation isn't great. All of the other features and functions are on there, but to be honest, I haven't really used them that much because like most cars now, you can pair your smartphone with that, whether that's through 
uh, um, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. And I guess the challenge for, for auto manufacturers nowadays is so many people do that. Is it worth them investing in um, uh, in their own MMI system? Um, and and I, I'm not so sure, um, but it does let the car down. Um, down here, you've got a wireless charge map, but again, something else that for me lets this car down there's no wireless apple carplay so i have to have a usb cable here to connect my phone and whilst actually there's probably advantages to doing that because let's face it wireless charge pads normally heat phones up and so on um it just makes it messy um, and it's a shame because there's a wireless mat there and it's quite tidy but then you've got this cable hanging around which basically does my ocd in completely um when we start driving the car there's lots to talk about so this is a plug-in hybrid. It will run on pure EV for up to about 40 miles. And in local driving around, uh, around town and, and so on, we've pretty much found that. And actually running as a pure EV, it's brilliant. As long as you remember to plug it in every night and charge up your battery, you almost, the first week we had this car, I don't think we used any fuel. I, was, I thought the, the petrol gauge had broken <laughs> because we were running on EV so much of the time. If you want to go on a longer journey than that, then you can put it into hybrid and then the two and a half litre petrol engine works in conjunction with that electric powertrain. And you've then got 300 horsepower and actually quite a lot of performance. And then the final thing you can do, which is quite cool, which we did when we were down in Cornwall, if you do run the battery pack down, the car will charge the battery pack. So if you push and hold the button down here, as you're driving along, some of the power from the engine goes into the battery pack and it basically charges up the battery itself. Clearly that has a detrimental effect on your fuel consumption. And also it doesn't sound great when it's doing it. And that is something we need to go and talk about while we're driving. Because for me, this car when you're driving is a real Jekyll and Hyde car. There are things it does that are brilliant and I love it to bits, especially when it's running as an EV around town. It's a brilliant, brilliant car. However, there are also some things it does when you're driving that, that really aren't great. And it's a lot to do with this CVT gearbox. So it's getting towards the end of the day now, the light is fading. So what my plans are is we're going to go for a drive tomorrow morning and I'm going to talk much, much more about this car because the longer you spend in it, the more you start to understand how the car works and the more you understand how to drive the car to its benefit so that you get the most out of the car and you almost set yourself these parameters of where the car behaves and performs at its best. If you go outside of those parameters, sometimes for me, this car lets itself down a little bit, but that is for tomorrow. So. Um, I will join you in the morning and we'll take this car up the road for a drive because there's so much to talk about. It is now the next day. It's not quite as cold today and not as sunny either. Now overnight I've charged the car and when I got in it this morning it had 41 miles of charge indicated. And one of the things I was going to say is I've got a 7 kilowatt wall box at home and on that you two three hours of charging depending on the battery state will fully replenish the battery but I can imagine quite a few people who have a plug-in hybrid might not go the whole hog and have a, a dedicated wall box they might just use a three pin granny charger but you're easily going to replenish the battery on one of these things overnight with a with a three pin granny charger so as long as you've got some off-street parking and that's always the comment I get whenever I do an EV or a plug-in hybrid if you've got off-street parking charging one of these overnight isn't too much of a problem and when you get in the car it defaults and starts off in EV and we're in EV at the moment and I must say when this car's running as an EV it is brilliant it's very smooth it's very quiet you get 35 to 40 miles of range so for a school run or if you had a work commute that was maybe 10 or 15 miles each way then you probably never need to fill this car up with fuel at all and as I said earlier on in the video you know when when we're using it locally we very rarely actually use the internal combustion engine but the good thing about it having an internal combustion engine is you don't have any range anxiety because as soon as the battery starts to get depleted and you start thinking, oh, I'm running out of EV miles, the car will just automatically switch over to run as a hybrid and then it's not a problem. And I think that's the first part of the car's strong suit is, is that multiple mode running. When it's running as an EV, I wanted to talk a lot about this CVT gearbox. 
the gearbox really is not a problem at all. It's very smooth, it's very linear, and, and there's obviously there's no engine to here over revving or anything. So actually as an EV, it runs brilliantly. And in this type of driving, locally, it's really, really good. The next mode I want to talk about though, is when you actually engage the internal combustion engine. So let's go off and find a bit of country roads and talk a bit more about that. Okay, still an EV, just to demonstrate its turn of pace from 30 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour. It's not going to set the world on fire, but it's not like it's a slouch. It stayed in EV all of that time. So even when you're running as, a, as an electric vehicle, this car is pretty nippy. However, let's just change the modes up a little bit. So if I just push the little mode button here, it will now turn it into a hybrid. The display changes a little bit. It stops talking about miles per kilowatt hour, which uh, it runs just under three, about two and a half miles per kilowatt hour in full EV, which isn't bad for a car that's not a dedicated EV. And it's now got a display that's measuring miles per gallon. So my combined miles per gallon in this car is running at just over 50 miles per gallon. Interestingly enough, when I was running this car a lot locally before we went to Cornwall, that number was up at 60, but when, because it had that combination of EV driving and, and petrol driving, because we did a lot of uh, hybrid petrol driving on holiday, it's now down at about 50. And I think that on a longer journey, that kind of 50 miles per gallon is probably about right around town, it's certainly gonna be much, much more than that. So first thing to first say, again, we're talking a bit about the gearbox. In this mode now, I can hear the engine and it's got a little bit of punch. I'm still in the normal driving mode. We'll step it up through the modes in a moment. And when you're driving like this, if you've not got a heavy right foot, it's a super, super car. And it was quite interesting. The comments I had on social media about CVT and can you talk more about the CVT box and a few of you had tried this car and didn't like it because of the CVT box. In the first couple of days I really didn't I didn't understand actually what you were on about because I didn't I didn't see a problem at all and then then you start pushing on. So as we leave the 30 mile an hour limit and go into a national speed limit if I just accelerate There you go. Now the problem with the CVT box, and I'm not gonna go into a deep and technical explanation of them, because you've got these two cones with a basically a rubber band running around them. And, and the problem that they have is that they have a tendency to, to sound like they're over revving when you, when you engage the throttle a little bit heavily. And it just, it's a very off-putting thing. If you don't push on, you don't really see it or feel it, but it, it, it almost it sounds like in a in a if you like a traditionally gearbox car it sounds like the clutch is slipping but it's not it's just the gearbox doing its thing and I don't like it <laughs> I'm really sorry I just don't like it it's not that it it's not that it changes the dynamics of the car in terms of how it drives this is a sporty little car it's got quite a lot of power when the hybrid system's working along with that two and a half liter petrol engine it's a nippy little car. The problem I have is just that 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 noise that sounds like the engine's really, really struggling. Okay, I'm gonna put it into sport mode. Now all the gal the dials change and go red and I want sport, but let's just see what it's like now in sport mode. It's quicker, it's more punchy, but then you get that that revving noise even more. Ah. Really, really want to like this car. It has, it has so much going for it. So much going for it. Now, when I had the Kia Sorento plug-in hybrid last year, I did a video about about how best to use or maximize a FEV. And, and one of the things I said is you really do need to plug it in overnight. And that's fine if you can. The challenge I had with the Sorento, I drove it down to Cornwall and I had nowhere to plug it in overnight. And I ran the battery pack down and then I had no way of recharging it. So 
I had to kind of run as a hybrid more. I had no option to run in full EV. The cool feature this car has, and I've driven a couple of cars with it, is it has the ability to charge the battery for you. So in order to do that, all I need to do is push the little button down that puts it into EV, hold it down for three or four seconds, and I'm now in charge mode. Now, I don't know if you can hear, but instantly the revs rise because now the engine, the petrol engine, is as well as driving the car, it's effectively being a generator to create uh, electricity to put into the battery pack. Now, that's all well and good. The problem with that is, especially on an incline, and I've come here on purpose, I'm only doing 40 miles an hour and you can hear the engine straining. And again, it's the CVT gearbox that's doing that. And it can be a little bit off-putting the steeper the gradient gets. A couple of times we did this in Cornwall with a typical Cornish hill that's like that. And it really did sound like the car was straining revs. Now, that's only a problem whenever you're in charge mode. And one of the things I mentioned before, if you're in charge mode, it's going to have a detrimental effect on your fuel economy because not only are you powering the car forward, but you're charging the battery. You can't make energy from nothing. Uh, we can't break the laws of physics. So what are my final impressions of the RAV4 plug-in hybrid? I found this video quite difficult to make because I really, really like this car. There are many, many things that have really endeared it to me. I think it looks great. It's a really comfortable car to be in for a long journey. It's very practical. It's got a huge amount of luggage space, lots of passenger space, and it's got all the kind of tech that I'd want. It's a shame that the infotainment system isn't quite as up to date as I'd like, although as you can see now I'm currently running Apple CarPlay, which is pretty much what I've been doing throughout my time with the car. In town running as an EV, if you're not pushing on as a hybrid, it's a brilliant car. It's very smooth, it's very quiet, and it just ticks lots and lots of boxes, especially on that school run, short commute, uh, family car. The thing that makes it more attractive than let's say the MG I had recently is the MG did all of those things well, but if you wanted to go on a longer journey, you're still in an EV with limited range. The great thing about this, fill it up with fuel and you've got over 450 miles of range as, an, as a hybrid, plus 35 to 40 miles of range as an EV. It makes it a really good long distance car. However, I really can't get on with this CVT gearbox. And CVT gearboxes are a little bit cheaper apparently to put into cars, but if you'd have just had a normal torque converter or you know some other kind of like a, the, the ubiquitous ZF gearbox you see in so many vehicles these days, I just think it would make this car so much better. It's the real weak point for me. And I can imagine lots of people see this car, look at the spec, look at what it looks like and think that's the car for me and then go for a drive and they experience the gearbox and they come back to the dealership and they don't they don't proceed i can imagine that happens quite a lot i think it would probably happen with me and it's a shame because you, you do need to give the car just that little bit more time as i said in an ev here we go you, you, you don't get that problem because you're not running the cvt if i put it into hybrid There you go. So it's such a frustrating car. I, I really hope that you appreciate my honesty. One of the things that we get thrown at us as car reviewers on YouTube, especially if you have tie-ins with brands or, or whatever, is that we are biased and we only ever say good things about cars. Well, that just simply is not the case. I have built a reputation over the last six years of, of saying things as they are. And if I think something's good, I'll say it's good. And if I think something could be better, I'll say that. And for me, this car is a classic example of that. 70% of this car I absolutely love, but the 30% I don't, it's a shame. I would love to know what you guys think. Have you driven a car with a CVT gearbox? If so, what was your experience? What do you guys think of the RAV4? But I hope you enjoyed that one. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. 
comments below are always welcome and if you haven't done so already please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come and I'll see you on the next film I'm going to make my way home and go and get a cup of tea anyway guys I'll see you on the next film you take care drive safe